And here's the first case. So there's a 48-year-old African-American, is it, it's 10 after, isn't it? Yes. Good, okay. 48-year-old African-American male presents for the initial physical exam. He denies any medical issues, feels well, and is new to town. His last exam was three years ago. His blood pressure has always been borderline high or high, as he tells you, but he cannot recall the values. Personally, he's a non-smoker, non-drinker. His weight's increased a little over the past three years. He's currently on no medications for hypertension, but he's been treated with two drugs in the past for his elevated blood pressure. He does not regularly exercise. His family history, mother had diabetes and hypertension at age 60, and she died of heart failure at age 73. Father's alive and well, but he has no contact with his father. He's an only child. He's unmarried and has no children. On physical examination, his blood pressure is 156 over 96. This is the average of three uh, seated, appropriately taken. His weight's 170 pounds, height 63 inches, BMI is 31, waist 37 inches, resting pulse 76. His eye grounds, and of note, he tells you, you ask him, <clears throat> has anyone ever looked in his eyes before? And he says, no. I've been to many physicians over the years. No one's ever looked in my eyes. But he has no hemorrhages or exudates, and he has a slight arterial or narrowing. Cardiac exam, peripheral artery exam is normal, and she, he has no edema on his lower extremity exam. Fairly benign exam. <laughs> Laboratory evaluation, uh, his fasting blood sugar is 105, his total cholesterol is 209, HDL 45, LDL 123, triglycerides 205. His estimated GFR is uh, 67 with a creatinine 1.0 on the lab sheet when you get it back. ALT is 30, TSH is normal, and his EKG shows a normal sinus rhythm with definite evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. His medicines, he's on a baby aspirin, he's on a Torvastatin 10, and he's on no blood pressure medications. Okay. Which of the following tests would you order in this patient? Now, Kathy, do we have these for them to uh, respond? Okay, by hand, good. Which of the following tests would you order? So here's how we're going to do it. Without looking at your neighbor, if you believe the answer is correct, please raise your hand immediately. So which of the following tests would you order in this patient? How many would order an echocardiogram to confirm LVH? How many of you would get a coronary calcium score? How many would get a high sensitivity CRP? How many would get a carotid intermedial thickness, CIMT? How many would do another test? Wow. Okay, so I think the correct answer is just five. The reason why we wouldn't uh, recommend in the American Society of Hypertension an echocardiogram is the fact that you already have LVH on an EKG. You have voltage, you have Estes criteria, you have an intrinsicoid deflection, you have uh, abnormal T wave inversion. Um, whatever it is, you can sink your teeth into it when you see LVH on an EKG, and that's very important because you have end organ disease, and you know that his blood pressures over many years that he even told you were not well controlled, have not been well controlled. Bill? So a hypertension So I have a general rule. If the test you order is not going to change what you already know you're going to need to do for the patient, don't order it. A general rule, because I think our, te our technological advances have often superseded our knowledge of knowing when to use them. So, you know, I practiced at the VA for 32 years. Clearly, I could order anything that I had evidence for, but I didn't like spending money just for the sake of this. And now that I'm at the medical school and practicing in the, in the, in the plan there, um, I'm, I'm amazed at what these tests cost. So, you know, I'll try to stay consistent on that. The coronary calcium score, I think, is a, an important test if you're on the fence for using a statin or not, but he's already on a statin. I don't think it's going to change what you're going to do much. High sensitivity CRP, he's already on the statin. I don't believe in CIMT. I think it's a poorly validated test. It has a lot of inter-observer variability. Um, I shudder to hear that there are vans and trucks going around the country doing some of these tests 
quote for free or for $195. You know, you can get a CIMT and you can get this and you can get that. I, I, you know, but, but I would do another test. Of course, his fasting blood sugar was 105, and the test I would have gotten was an A1C, and it came back 6. So he's got prediabetes, if you will, between 5.7 and 6.4. And some might argue to get a spot urine for protein. Um, I did tell you, didn't I, that the urinalysis was, see, I didn't tell you that. So that was something that I didn't tell you. And certainly you'd want to know uh, what his urine is. Uh, certainly you want to know what his protein is. And I'm not concerned about microalbuminuria. There is no drug, no antihypertensive that is FDA approved for microalbumin because we really have no good outcomes to show that targeting microalbumin improves outcome. And I will tell you that every antihypertensive that lowers blood pressure lowers microalbumin, okay? And yes, we could agree that uh, dihydropyridine is not the best drug to use in someone with clinical proteinuria as the first drug, but it's a hell of a drug to add to a RAS blocker to further lower blood pressure. And in the SPRINT trial and in ACCORD, in the non-diabetic and in the diabetic, as we lowered blood pressure in the intensive group, we could see albumin melting away in these patients as we continue to follow them. And I promise you, if you're lowering blood pressure in these patients, you're at least stabilizing the albumin, if not reducing it in the urine. So I'm a, a guy that doesn't like to spend a lot of money, um, and so that's pretty much how I would have approached this. Comments on this question? Concerns? Feel differently than what I said? Okay. So, African American, 48 years of age, in blacks, hypertension is more prevalent in African Americans and it's among the highest prevalence in the world. Hypertension occurs earlier in life in the African American, starting about 10 years earlier than in non-African Americans. And all these slides are in your PDF. Hypertension is more severe in the African American. Hypertension is more difficult to control in the African American. And hypertension more often leads to target organ disease, cardiovascular events, and chronic kidney disease. It's concerning that 14% of Americans are African Americans, and 67% of all Americans on dialysis are African Americans. And the number one and number two causes are hypertension and diabetes. And that clearly is a racial disparity that over time may lessen. But clearly, uh, a lot of it has to do with access. A lot of it is in young men who have no reason to go to a clinician, don't, don't need mammography, don't need to get a pelvic, don't need to get HPV, blah, 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 on a, on a, on a cervical smear. So they have no reason to go to the physician. And this is why we have had these barbershop groups where we try to get young African-American men who require haircuts to get their blood pressure taken in barbershops. So a lot of issues here. Um, clearly we've shown in studies we've done that when you compare the VA and the non-VA in the African-American community, the racial disparity is lessened for blood pressure control. Nevertheless, in the all-hat trial, double-blind randomized trial of 42,000 individuals with more than 15,000 of them uh, African-American, you can see that both in women and in men, um, African-Americans within the same trial are less likely to be controlled to less than 140 over less than 90 than non-African-Americans. And of note, the South, Southeast, within all hat, when we broke it down into all geographic territories, were the most difficult to control. So if you practice in the South, Southeast, um, if you practice in the stroke belt, Clearly, we need to be sensitive to some of these issues in, in this minority community. When you look at the REGARDS trial, the reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke study, you can see that, surprisingly, blacks uh, have a, a greater prevalence. They're actually more aware of their having hypertension than whites. Um, they are more likely to be treated than whites, and yet they're still less likely to be controlled. So if you look further into some of the outcome observations from this REGARDS trial, you'll see that when blood pressure's not elevated or minimally elevated in the middle as opposed to stage one hypertension, uh, an African-American is more likely to go on to have a stroke 
within the observation of the trial um, than a non-African American. So more reason to be, um, you know, targeting this group for access, for care, for blood pressure control, for out-of-office blood pressure measurement, and all the things that go with any patient, regardless of skin color. In addition to lifestyle changes, with what would you treat this patient? You can remember the patient, right? Stage one hypertension. Would you use, and show me, you see the answer, show me your hands. Uh, which is the best answer, perhaps? Would you use a thiazide diuretic? Raise your hand. Okay, would you use a beta blocker? Okay, would you use an ACE or an ARB? Some would, as the first and only drug in an African American with poorly controlled hypertension. Not post MI, not with HEFREF, okay. A CCB, okay. How many would use combination at the get-go? Okay, okay. I think one, four, and five are correct answers, but um, you know, you can challenge me on it, but I like five as well. Almost stage two hypertension, um, not costing much more to put two drugs into one pill. Certainly, you could argue for lisinopril, HCTZ, or even uh, the generic, but not $4, um, benazoprel, amlodipine. So nice combinations. Um, and when you look at the JNC8 quote unquote document, the four variables, this patient's less than 60. This patient does not have chronic kidney disease by GFR and by urine um, albumin, does not have diabetes, but is African American. And when you look at the algorithm, although it's hard for you to see, you'll see that the initial drug recommended is a thiazide type diuretic or a CCB alone or in combination. Now, let me just one quick word about why we don't have um, amlodipinetic, diltiazoretic, veraporetic. And the reason is because calcium channel blockers are extremely sodium sensitive drugs. That is, the higher the sodium intake, like in an African American community, the greater the blood pressure reduction. So if you just vary sodium intake in your population and compare their blood pressure reduction on a CCB like amlodipine, same dose, different sodium intake. The more the higher the sodium intake, the greater the blood pressure reduction. These drugs actually have sodium losing properties. They're not diuretic because they don't increase the flow of urine, but they do increase the sodium excretion. So the reason why we've never had a combination of a thiazide with a CCB is because the sodium intake could not be held constant. And because of the variety and variable uh, uh, intake of sodium, the, we could never show to the FDA that in a given patient, these drugs were additive rather than not additive in combination than as a single drug. I do think they work together. They have never been studied, but I would never be against your using a CCB and a thiazide, thiazide-like diuretic as the first two drugs in an African American or in an elderly patient. Um, although most people are going to use one of these two drugs with a RAS blocker. So I think that's where we stand on choosing an initial drug in hypertension. What was said in the 2014 quote unquote JNC8 guideline in the general black population, initial antihypertensive treatment should include a thiazide, thiazide type diuretic, or calcium channel blocker. Okay. When you look at the All Hat trial done by the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, we were very involved uh, in All Hat in Charleston, um, as were 497 other centers for the primary outcome of fatal coronary heart disease or non-fatal MI. The government was concerned uh, in the Indian Health Service and um, in Medicare and um, in in Medicaid and in 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 areas where they were responsible for the formulary. They were concerned that all of us were drinking, you know, the Kool-Aid that the pharmaceutical companies were saying when they said that Norvasc and Prinavil and Zestril um, and Cardura were better drugs than a thiazide, thiazide type diuretic. They had no metabolic effects. They didn't cause impotence. Um, why would you ever use a thiazide type diuretic? And that was the whole reasoning behind doing the all hat trial to compare to see if lisinopril was superior to clothalidone, amlodipine superior to clothalidone, doxazosin 
superior to clothalidone. And remember, the doxazosin arm was stopped early because of futility, and there was an observation of an increased risk for certain events, but cardiovascular events. But remember, in all hat, on the day of randomization, we stopped the patient's drugs, which may have included a thiazide diuretic, and did not allow them to go back on a thiazide diuretic. So this may have caused some reason for why patients were more likely to have heart failure, et cetera, because they couldn't be given a diuretic. So with that said, nevertheless, chlorthalidone was unsurpassed in the outcomes. Lisinopril was not better than chlorthalidone. Uh, amlodipine was not a more effective drug than chlorthalidone on outcomes on outcomes. And when you looked at the African American, and that's our, what our patient is today, the stroke risk on lisinopril was 40% greater than the stroke on chlorthalidone. And the reason for that was that the blood pressure reduction was less, because the African American responded less to the lisinopril, up to 40 milligrams a day as an initial drug, than the thiazide chlorthalidone, up titration to 25. The difference between clothalidone and amlodipine was much less in blood pressure difference. And the stroke risk was similar. So um, this is an important slide for that reason, and this is why we recommend clothalidone or amlodipine in a patient that can't tolerate clothalidone, shouldn't be on clothalidone, um, and not lisinopril in the African American. Nevertheless, the first three drugs, please, you're in good evidence-based outcome uh, support if you use, in no particular order, a RAS blocker, ACE, or ARB. And we really don't know which class is better in hypertension. But I will tell you, we have no evidence that the ARB is better. No evidence. If anything, perhaps the ACE is, but it's not tolerated as well. So no dog in that fight. A RAS blocker, one of the two, up titrated to the highest dose they tolerate. And that would be, in my practice, 40 of lisinopril, not 80. 10 of amlodipine, not 20, 25 of clothalidone, perhaps 50 of hydrochlorothiazide. CCB, amlodipine, I like 10 more than 5 than 2.5, but if 2.5 is all mama will take because she likes open-toed shoes and she gets edema, understandable, because 2.5 is better than none. Okay, and um, the same with the thiazide. Try to uptitrate to the best dose, but some is better than none. And um, beta blockers are no longer recommended in our guidelines as an initial drug. But if you do use them, they're better in the younger patient than the elderly. The outcomes are better in the younger patient than the elderly. And that's why the Canadian Hypertension Society, which updates their guidelines every year, does recommend a beta blocker in those less than 60 as an initial drug. We do not, but they do. Okay. Here's what the uh, British do in their um, NICE guidelines, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're younger, they recommend a RAS blocker, ACE or ARB. If you're older or black, a CCB. Then the other drug. So if you like a RAS blocker with a CCB, so do the NICE guidelines. But as the third drug, they recommend a diuretic. And as the fourth drug, they recommend another diuretic like spironolactone. So it's very similar. It's just a matter of which drugs do you use first in a given patient. And some of this comes from the ACCOMPLISH trial, which I didn't share with you, which was a double-blind randomized trial, a fixed-dose combination, which was benazepril amlodipine versus benazepril HCTZ as initial drug. And actually, the amlodipine partner with the, the ACE had better outcomes than the HCTZ partner with the ACE. That's the accomplished trial. 15,000 initially randomized to a fixed dose combination drug, verse one versus the other, industry supported by the makers of Lotrell, Novartis. We were part of it, but it was a very well, very well constructed um, study. Perhaps amlodipine was better than HCTZ because there was more than 50% of people with coronary disease on entry, 20% with stroke, and amlodipine is a very good drug when you've had angina or coronary disease or you've had a stroke. 
So maybe the deck, based on the population studied, was stacked in amlodipine's favor. Nevertheless, those were the outcomes. Amlodipine better than HCTZ um, with a RAS blocker. I remember writing an editorial saying, well, what would, what would we have accomplished had we used clothalidone instead of hydrochlorothiazide? But we don't know that. We don't know that. Okay. And then finally, the last um, guideline I'll show you, which is the International Society and our own American Society guideline. And on the far left is our African-American patient, first drug, CCB or thiazide, not controlled, add the other or add a RAS blocker. At the end of the day, the first three drugs, CCB, thiazide, and ACE or ARB. So there's a lot of similarity. But this is why when people are referred to me on clonidine and hydralazine and a beta blocker, I just don't understand it. Okay. You're seeing a patient and you've decided to use lisinopril 20 as the first drug. They're not controlled. You need to do something else. Would it behoove you to increase the lisinopril to 40 or add a diuretic or a CCB at that point? How many want to just increase or uptitrate at that point to 40 of lisinopril? How many want to add another drug from another class? Yes, that's the correct answer. And what this meta-analysis shows of over half a million individual patient treatment, treatments is that in purple, you will always get about fourfold more blood pressure by adding a drug from another class that makes physiologic pathophysiologic sense than by doubling the dose of the first drug. That's not to say you shouldn't eventually be on 40 of lisinopril, but 20 to 2012.5 of lisinopril HCT, actually at the same price, makes a lot more sense than 40 of lisinopril, although you may want to backfill later with 40 12.5. Okay? That's what this slide says. And then finally, we wrote a paper uh, as part of the American Society of Hypertension um, um, writing group on, for blood pressure reduction, the preferred combinations. And it's an ACE diuretic, ARB diuretic, ACCB, ARB, CCB. Others are acceptable, but they just don't give you as much blood pressure reduction as those four initial combinations. They can be in a single pill. They can be in two pills. The adherence tends to be better with a single pill, but Sometimes, based on cost, two pills may be cheaper. Questions or comments? Okay, we're moving on. SL is an 83-year-old Caucasian male with a long history of hypertension who presents to your office for evaluation of his hypertension. Currently off the lisinopril because of a cough. Currently. Um, no longer taking metoprolol for his blood pressure. 186 pounds, BMI 26.9, waist circumference 34 inches, blood pressures, sitting, average of three, standing, especially in the elderly, before you treat and every time you see them as you're treating them. No orthostasis, sustained hypertension, out-of-office blood pressures, similar. Average of three readings done for one week at various times of the day for one month. Show you that in a second. Fasting glucose 84, K 4.2, creatinine 1.3, calculated estimated GFR 70. Fasting lipids, you see them. EKG, normal sinus rhythm, printed out, WNL. Your analysis, no evidence of proteinuria. Would you order any additional test to decide what to do for this patient? How many would like to order additional tests? Please raise your hand. How many would not like to order any more tests? Okay. Very nice. I wouldn't order any more tests. I think I know what to do for this patient, and I don't know what a further tests would necessarily do. Um, how would you classify this patient's elevated blood pressure? So it's like 176 over 78, let's just say. So is the best answer, one, two, three, or four. So one, raise your hand, systolic, diastolic, hypertension, best answer. Two, isolated stage one, systolic. Three, isolated stage two, systolic. Or four, none of the above. Very nice. Isolated stage two, systolic. Super. So, natural history of blood pressure. 
Um, and this comes from a, a, a more recent paper, but this is work that's been done for, for 50 years. And it shows the inevitable but not normal consequence of aging. And that is to say that both men and women, as we age, your systolic and diastolic continue to rise as we age. The arteriosclerosis that occurs in the stiffening of the vessels, we pay a price as the heart ejects against that stiffening with a continued elevation over time in systolic as we age. However, diastolic peaks at about 50 to 55 years of age, and then it falls. Because during relaxation, there's a drop off, OK? And that difference is called the pulse pressure. So for a given systolic pressure, a wider pulse pressure is a greater risk for cardiovascular disease. Which patient is at less risk? 170 over 70 or 170 over 100 at 80 years of age? Less risk, not treated. 170 over? Thank you, excellent. Same systolic. Well shown in the Framingham Heart Study, same systolic, but a more narrow pulse pressure. There's not the runoff in diastole. The, the, the filling pressures are more favorable, even though the pressure is higher. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the natural history of, of blood pressure. And of course, the natural history of, of blood pressure is for most of us to get hypertension as we reach the oldest of the oldest age. And you can see that. And women a little more likely than men. Uh, in the extremes of age. Now, what's interesting is if you don't have hypertension at age 55 or at age 65, and let's just look at women at age 55 or men at age 55, 25 years later, you have a 90% chance of then being hypertensive. So this is often an inevitable but not normal consequence of aging. As those uh, westernized society diets and our lifestyles and everything we do um, causes arteriolar sclerosis, hardening of those vessels, systolic pressures go above 140. Okay, so not uncommon to see the oldest of the old having stage one systolic isolated or combined hypertension. Okay. What goal blood pressure would you try to achieve in this 83-year-old? So there are a number of them here, including answer five, patient involved in form decision making as to the best goal. So who wants to get the pressure to less than 120 over less than 80 in this 83 year old? Number two, less than 130 over less than 80, one. Number three, less than 140 over less than 90, okay. Number four, less than 150 over less than 90, okay. And number five, informed decision making, okay. Uh, this is a tough one, um, and I understand why many of you gave answers that I think, you know, on a, a, you could petition me and I'd accept all of them back in the days of college, you know, I'd have to accept all the answers in med school. But I, actually, at the current time, I think number five is the best. If you can t discuss with the patient why you feel in their situation a particular goal is best, you document it in the chart, I think you're probably on pretty solid ground here. But I do want to share with you the sprint trial. First, the JNC8 guideline caused a lot of controversy because after lifestyle modification, in those 60 years of age and older, for the first time it gave a goal of less than 150 over less than 90. This caused a lot of commotion, a lot of communication, a lot of concern. But there were no good clinical trial evidence to suggest that, and um, a number of guidelines said that in the oldest of the old, um, but in those 60 to 79 years of age, many still recommended less than 140 over less than 90, as you see from the ASH and the Amer Europeans and the American guidelines, the first two on there. Um, would you treat this patient 83 years of age with pharmacologic therapy? Yes, to improve outcomes. No, is too old and treating him would do more harm than good or three, you're unsure. How many would treat this patient with drug therapy after lifestyle? How many would not? Okay, and how many are unsure? Okay, I agree, I would treat this individual. And I think just looking at age is, is not the best way to look at um, uh, chronologic age doesn't really stand up as much as the frailty index or um, you know, comorbidities and some of those uh, aspects of the patient's presentation. We do have tremendous evidence in the oldest of the old from the HIVET trial. These are mean age of 84, stage two systolic and combined hypertension, 
on an indoline diuretic and dapamide with or without perindoprel, and the act stopped early because the active group had tremendous outcomes and less death. And this put an end to any concern that the oldest of the old should not be treated with antihypertensive therapy because you'll do more harm than good. You do more good than harm, okay? And um, we talked about that yesterday. We also have the SHEP trial in stage two isolated systolic hypertension, chlorothaladone first, beneficial. The mean blood pressure was 143 over 68. The mean blood pressure in HIVET was 148. Yes, both of those are less than 150. So the sweet spot from an evidence base could be 140 to 149. However, a lot of concern about that. And we showed this yesterday. So here's the SPRINT trial. Recently published, stopped early by the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute. We've been doing this trial since 2007. We actually started it in that it was gathering a lot of um, reasoning for why we needed to do it. And we started in 2011, and we stopped it in 2015. It tested whether a treatment strategy aimed at reducing systolic pressure to a lower goal, less than 120, compared with less than 140, would reduce the occurrence of cardiovascular disease. 9,361 final participants, and SPRINT stands for the Systolic Prevention Intervention Trial. The primary outcome was a composite of MI stroke, heart failure, acute coronary syndrome other than MI, so they could present with unstable angina, but they couldn't present with an MI or cardiovascular death. And the primary hypothesis, the statistics and the methods were designed to be able to show that the lower pressure, assuming the event rate would be what had been observed up to that point by the statisticians, that the lower blood pressure would be able to show superiority to the less than 140 blood pressure. Secondary objectives, secondary endpoints, total death, progression of CKD, probable dementia, cognitive impairment, and white matter lesions detected by MRI. The idea being that if lower pressure was better, does that come at the cost of less cognitive performance or more dementia? That's an answer still hasn't been resolved in SPRINT. That's why we continue to follow these people with the um, cognitive testing that we continue to do uh, and will continue to do until June of 2016 when the last patient actually will be closed out. So although we've stopped the intervention in the trial, we're still following the patients for this very important question of cognitive function. The idea being whom in this room would want to live longer achieving a lower blood pressure, live longer free of vascular events, okay, but at the same time have more cognitive decline. So that's why we're continuing it. You had to be 50 years of age or older, no upper age exclusion, um, and you could have a systolic blood pressure from 130 to 180. But if your blood pressure was um, higher than 170, you could be on up to four, excuse me, if you were 130 to 150, you could be on up to four medications. 130 to 163, 130 to 172, and 130 to 180, zero or one. The idea being, if your baseline blood pressure was 178, and you were already on four medicines, we'd never get you to less than 120. So that's why we use this algorithm for deciding how you could enter the trial, but you could have a blood pressure at 50 years of age and older from 130 to 180 systolic. And there were four high-risk groups that were looked at in SPRINT. You had to have either underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, clinical or subclinical, chronic kidney disease, and that was at least stage three or less, but not advanced stage four CKD, a Framingham risk score of at least 15% over 10 years or more, and by the way, the average Framingham risk score in this trial is 22% at 10 years of all participants. That's been calculated. And you could be in a fourth group of age 75 years of age and older. And these are very important groups because we need to know if lower is better than 130 to 139 systolic, which was the less intensive group's goal. We did not study stroke patients or diabetics because they are being or had been looked at in other trials. 
you couldn't have clinical heart failure or an ejection fraction less than 35%. You couldn't have advanced clinical proteinuria, one gram or more. You couldn't have advanced chronic kidney disease. And you couldn't have a problem taking medicines at any point. Okay, so there couldn't be flags that adherence in the past had been a concern. Here are the baseline characteristics. Intensive, standard, double-blind, randomized, less than 120, less than 140, preferred 130 to 139. Mean age, 68, 28% of the oldest, about a third women, um, more than half white, almost a third African American, 10% Hispanic, 20% prior CVD, overall Framingham risk score at baseline 20.1, um, recalculated we think it's 22%. 90 um, percent were on previous antihypertensive medications, 10 percent had never been treated with any antihypertensive, and there's the baseline blood pressure, and just short of two medicines coming into the trial. Um, GFR, percent with GFR less than 60, one of the four targeted groups. Um, urinary albumin, 42 milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine, total cholesterol, plasma glucose, baseline. Blood pressure was monitored for the first three months every month. We saw these people every month for the first three months and every three months thereafter. So that's the first thing that you ask yourself. How often do you see your patients with hypertension in your clinical practice? Antihypertensive medication titration decisions were based on the mean of three readings at each visit using a structured step care approach using an oscillometric device, preferred to get the blood pressure before they ever saw the clinician on the day of their visit. Agents from all major antihypertensive drug classes were available free of charge. Periodic assessment for orthostatic hypotension and related symptoms was done. So we were able to really get the blood pressure down. Um, by one year in the standard group, mean was 136. In the intensive group, 121. That means that half were uh, less than 121.4 and half were higher, okay. And it came at the expense of adding um, almost no medicine to the standard group, 1.8 to 1.9 meds now, and 1.8 to 3 in the intensive group. So about one medicine more, one, one class of medicine more to get to the intensive blood pressure reduction. Stopped early, median follow-up 3.26 years. Uh, because the Data Monitoring Safety Board had been uh, observing this um, um, split in the event rates, not knowing which group was which, but after a final point, they said, hey, we can't allow the study to continue. It will never um, change in its direction. We don't believe so, and um, we already know one group is doing this much better than the other and living longer. And when they broke the code, the intensive group had done better. And here are those... Um, 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 plots, um, and uh, you can see uh, the nice split at one year, and the uh, primary um, outcome is significantly better, 25% reduction in the intensive group than the um, standard group, and the NNT for the composite outcome is 61. The primary outcomes reduced 25%, highly statistically significant, however, MI went in the trend, 17% reduction, not significant. Non-MI acute coronary syndrome, not significant. And all stroke, 11% reduction, not significant. But first evidence of clinical heart failure, 38% reduced. And cardiovascular disease death, 43% reduced. Both highly significant. Now, when you look at all of these subgroups, you can see that on the forest plot, um, as opposed to the Kaplan-Meier curve, Here's the univariate line, and that goes through one. So everything to the left suggests that the intensive treatment is better. Everything to the right of that univariate line would suggest that the higher blood pressure would be better. Now, even though the confidence intervals, the horizontal line going through the size of the box, which tells you how many events were occurring, even though that does cross the univariate line because there wasn't power in that subgroup to show a benefit, there was no heterogeneity between the groups compared a priori. There's always a, a, an apparent benefit um, in the intensive group. And just to show you, looking at the oldest of the old, they clearly benefited um, compared to those that weren't 75 years of age and older, who also benefited, 
okay? But they approach the univariate line. But you can see, you know, men, women, there's no, um, uh, there are not enough women to show benefit. But everyone's going in the right direction. That lowers better. And even if you started with a systolic pressure of 132 or less, you're doing better, okay? Remember, you could have been on anywhere from zero to four medicines um, at that point, but you still did better entering on that pressure. Now, when you look at all-cause death, that was the primary endpoint. Once again, the same sort of trend. Everything looks better to the left of the univariate line for intensive blood pressure. And once again, for death, age 75 and older, less than 120. Remember, we achieved about 121 at one year, and the mean overall is about 123, 124. Now, the, um, the outcomes were better, but what about the um, adverse events? And um, although there is statistical significance in the hypotension, uh, let's be fair, it's one per hundred are more likely to be hypotensive. Um, uh, six per thousand are more likely to have syncope. Um, an electrolyte abnormality is um, eight per thousand. An acute injury, uh, kidney injury, which was more likely to occur in those without chronic kidney disease. That is, as you get this blood pressure reduced without chronic kidney disease, the kidney doesn't like a precipitous drop in blood pressure. Creatinine goes up, and there's about at least a 50% or more change in GFR in the non in, in the intensive group without kidney disease. So there were some. Um, observations that were intuitively not what you would expect. Very interesting. And although people are making a lot of these adverse events, I think they're statistically significant and you need to follow potassium and sodium and blood pressure and renal function, but I don't think it's a game changer because we can follow those. If the payers will pay for that, if we can be more vigilant, if we get paid for being more vigilant in how often we see these hypertensive patients, it can be done. That's what's being decided right now. That's why none of you are being held to less than 120 right now. And it won't be less than 120, because the mean was 121. It's going to be somewhere, I think, less than 130. But it'll be an individualized decision when it's all said and done. And by the way, orthostatic hypotension was more likely in the standard group than the intensive group, another intuitively different outcome than you would have thought would have occurred. Okay. So what would you do with this woman? She stopped her metoprolol. Would you increase the dose of metoprolol, start a CCB, start an ACE or an ARB, start a thiazide, use a combination? How many for number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? Number five? Okay. You know, it's interesting. I like the answer number five, but in the oldest of the old, I'm less likely to start a combination because I'm just going to watch them a little more carefully, and I'm going to start low and go slow, but I'm not going to forget about them. I'm not going to suffer from clinical inertia. Okay. So that's really what I wanted to take you through in the oldest of the old. I do want to share one final thing with you, because I don't want to go over my time. But I did have a very fascinating case of a 34-year-old brother, male, who wanted to be a potential kidney donor. And Suffice it to say, and you can go through the case later, because of his anxiety, he always had in-office blood pressures that were elevated and out-of-office blood pressures that were not. And he, he was a perfect match for his sister, and nobody else was a match for his sister. So the, the end of the, uh, the case is that we used out-of-office measurement and were able to show that his blood pressures were better out of the office than in the office. He had the white coat or alert reaction. That he could, we believe in self-measurement of blood pressure. We would like an ICD-9 code of hypertension to automatically get a home monitoring device for our patients with an ICD-9 code of hypertension because there are outcomes here. They're more likely to take their medicine and have better blood pressure control. Why the government won't allow us to do this? The VA does it, Kaiser does it, but right now our government won't pay for that. By the way, they won't pay for a dietician either, which is also absurd in patients with hypertension, but whatever. So here's how you self-measure blood pressure. I do not like patients to be um, a prisoner to their measurement at home, but I like one week of measurement, no more than once a month, 
throw out the first day, two in the morning, two in the evening, bring those to the clinic. You see them in three months, you get three weeks measurements from three different months. That's in there. Um, I do want to show you the difference between white coat, which is in office elevation, but out of office, less than 135. I won't talk about masked, but you're going to hear about it. How many of you have heard about masked hypertension? This is where the diagnosis is masked to us because they actually appear normal in the office, but actually they are elevated out of the office. More likely to occur in blacks, more likely to occur in chronic kidney disease, more likely to occur in the elderly. Observationally, they do pay a price for this misdiagnosis, but it's a new category. We don't have a lot of outcomes. Stay tuned. So that's in the top left. Our patient really was a white coat. And what I want to show to you is that here's his 24-hour ABPM. And you can see that if you go with 140 over 90, most of his blood pressures throughout the day are low. He doesn't meet the burden of hypertension by a 24-hour ABPM, which, depending on your software, will tell you the load, how many he has above either 135 over 85, which is what we use as the criteria out of the office for hypertension. Here, we were looking at 140 over 90. And when you're asleep, you should dip, drop, and, and it should be less than 120 over 80. And while you sleep, you want to have at least 10% of the values less than that. If you don't, you're considered a non-dipper. This may be a reason why you'd give one of your medicines at bedtime. Otherwise, you don't have to. So you're looking at a 24-hour ABPM. It's a primary care tool. Currently, it's for the specialist. It's going to change. Why? Because the United States Public Service Task Force in the annals in 2015 is now recommending it to confirm the diagnosis of out-of-office blood pressure elevation. And it's a little bit of a shock. And we've got to get the payers to pay, but that's what the evidence suggests. So it'll be interesting to see if the payers hook up the evidence with the payment. So stay tuned on that. But there's the reference there. And here's a nice algorithm we just published in the American Society of Hypertension, which just shows you how you can use out-of-office measurement or home measurement compared to 24-hour ABPM. And I'll let you look at that at another time. Okay, so basically our patient had a 24-hour ABPM. He wasn't hypertensive. We were able to get him, we were able to show that he wasn't hypertensive. Thus, he could lose one of his kidneys. His sister would be getting a healthy kidney, and he got the transplant. So with that, my take-home me me um, messages, initiation at less than 140 over less than 90, how much lower to lower blood pressure is a moving target. Stay tuned. We'll see where Sprint and the dust settles. Don't forget about lifestyle. There are your initial choices of drugs, ACEs and ARBs in CKD, post-MI, heart failure with reduced EF. Otherwise, ethnicity is important. Age is important. Combination therapy is important. Use beta blockers, but in the right patient, perhaps the younger than the old, those with compelling indications, perhaps as a fourth drug. Don't forget about spironolactone. It's going to make you a hero. If you're not using amlodipine or long-acting nifedipine, it's going to make you a hero. The other thing is, don't forget about an alpha blocker. That's a hero drug as a fifth drug, and maybe a mealeride, especially if your patient needs potassium preservation. OK. So with that, I will stop. I'll ask the panel to come up, and we'll do the panel, and we'll get out of here by 10 to 11. OK, great. So you guys have your questions. Start thinking of them. I'm going to have the panel come up right here. And um, Kathy maybe has a mic. And. Um